first of all uh, good evening everyone uh, it's uh, and i think welcome to the prestige uh, speakers it's very good to see people uh, you know face to face after a long time and uh, i think two years has been gone like you know it's it's vanished in the air because we were mostly at home so it's good to see faces uh, i live in uk and in uk we still have we still don't want to meet people so i'm very happy to see so many people here uh, in the conference uh, what 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 i'm trying to do is we'll we'll keep us this session pretty interactive i've uh, i've there's so many questions so i can't remember also i've kind of noted down some of the questions uh, you know i had in my mind when i was traveling to india to kind of see what where the fa indian fashion industry is going so you know i don't have you know i'll just ask and probably uh, whoever will probably answer the question can can tip in and we'll keep it pretty interactive and let's see how we go from there yeah i hope that's fine so i think the f the first question which i'm sure everybody has in their mind is that the everything has changed before and after covid right i think before covid we do so many things which we are not doing right now so where do you see fashion going on post covid since now we are back to the normalization and we can go to a store and actually see the clothes from our eyes so probably uh, Manish, probably you can answer that, um, you know, this question, and then what's your view on that? So, see, basically, as in, uh, if I look at it, uh, while those two years, uh, as in, have effectively, as in, just like vanished, like two months or something, as in, I think it gave us a lot of time in terms of doing housekeeping, looking at ourselves in terms of uh, where we are in terms, our customer journeys. Uh, do we need to fast forward certain areas or we or do we need to increase investments in certain areas uh, most of the uh, brands or businesses across the board across segments have done that the reality is that if i look at it uh, from what's happening on floor what's happening from the consumer perspective uh, things have drastically changed as in it's everything is back to normal on the floor when i look at offline space we are growing phenomenally uh, as compared to even what we were doing in 2000 pre covid numbers so uh, the consumer is back with a vengeance the only difference is that this is not a revenge buying sort of a sprint or this is something which is going to stay because there is a very clear change in the consumer perspective in terms of how they were looking at life uh, the 30 35 year olds have realized that uh, if you have the money better spend it live your life uh, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So I think that's the biggest change as in people keep talking about casualization and uh, leisure wear and all those things growing. I think the biggest change has been in terms of the consumer perspective, how they are looking at life. Uh, the other big change that we have seen as in e-commerce has grown rapidly, especially in the last two years. It has comparatively slowed down in terms of the last three months and that's a phenomenon that's there in Europe also. We run uh, Hackett, Faso, Nabla and uh, Tommy and Calvin uh, in the European geographies also. So very clearly as in uh, uh, offline has uh, taken a, a front seat, uh, e-commerce or as in what we call as digital has slowed down a bit. But at the same time when I look at it, it's also getting difficult in terms of uh, actually bifurcating uh, online and offline revenues because of the changes that we have done in the way that we work a lot of uh, online orders get service from offline stores or a lot of those sort of things have come in. So effectively, as in, we are much more geared up to offer the consumers a seamless sort of a shopping experience across formats that they want to shop across. And uh, that's where we are. And I think because of this vengeance, I see packet from Amazon in front of my door every day. Because my wife does shopping every day. Because Sorry? of pre-COVID and post-COVID. The packets from? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm saying, you said that people are back now. And they're pretty now aggressively shopping. So I see a packet from Amazon every day in front of my house. Probably my wife does shopping. So that's yeah. the that's the sure. That's as in that's the effectively what's happened is that things like Amazon or the Flipkarts of the world, as in they've become your go-to place in terms of saying that anything that you want, uh, that's the first place that you look at. Yeah, and I think the data says 67 percent of consumers started shopping more and more. I think that's yeah. I think the bigger change that's happened in India is that. Uh, uh, we were always trying to change consumer habits uh, and especially in the online scenario as in discount was the primary motivator uh, or the bait that was being offered. I think we've moved over from that. Uh, we've realized that as in 
things like time of delivery in terms of the experience that you are able to give uh, in terms of your delivery timelines, in terms of what you offer on the website, in terms of your consumer experience are becoming important. And consumer is going and shopping online just because of the need or uh, the timelines or the uh, convenience that it offers rather than just the discounting bit that was attracting them previously. Makes sense, got it. Anybody, anybody has any points to that? Hi, uh, so I'm from XYXX, which is a small startup in the Innovaya space, right? And uh, before COVID, we were non-existent. And I think after COVID is when people started noticing us because that's when digital adoption started to happen in a tremendous way. And not only in the metros or the tier one cities, but across tier three, tier four cities as well. So I think a lot of brands have got disproportionate exposure via e-commerce to tier three, tier four markets. That's happened. Uh, because of the COVID wave that happened. Secondly, after uh, COVID has ended, right, we saw multiple waves and I think after every wave, we saw offline increasing and then suddenly coming to a halt. So that kind of impacted the supply chain in the middle drastically. And I think now that, uh, and that kind of resulted in massive increases in the price points that we are currently offering to consumers, right, from a cost perspective. So some brands are able to absorb the cost. Some people are passing it on to the consumer. But what the interesting part is, customers are still shopping, right? And are willing to pay that higher price. And I think a lot has to do with what has happened, what is happening in the last, uh, or also in the future, is that uh, traveling has opened up in a big way. And that has contributed immensely to uh, shopping, right? Uh, the other thing is, after two years, a lot of people will get married. Right, uh, and marriage is a very big occasion in India where shopping happens. And I think every brand therefore is looking and is very bullish. Like from an inner way space, nothing happens for us, right? Uh, you have to buy an underwear uh, because it's an essential, right? Uh, it was the first category that opened during COVID, but from casual wear to say uh, party wear to formal wear, I think a lot of these things will start gaining trend as the festive season builds up. So I think that's my view. Got it. And I think uh, f a follow-up question to that, has the behavior you've seen is different across categories? Like for example, some categories are best selling now and some categories not, or like women's are purchasing more compared to men. How does it probably working right now? Probably you can answer this question. Uh. Yeah, so we've, uh, like what uh, he was saying, I'll build on that one. We've seen a lot of uh, occasion ceremonial wear doing well because I believe there were 40 lakh marriages which happened in the first quarter of this year. Uh, I don't know where that number came from, but yeah, we saw a lot of uh, marriage shopping happening there. It was also back to offices. So we, being a primarily a formal wear brand, we saw a lot of formal wear category happening. Having said that, doesn't take away the fact that casualization is a trend which has been on even pre-COVID. Mm. And we are seeing a lot of traction we are seeing modern trade shifting space, giving space of formal brands to casual brands. So therefore, there's a lot of casualization which has happened as a trend. I've seen that. Having said that, also remember that this is the first time after two years that all the festivities are being allowed in a physical form. This is the first year there will be no restrictions on the pujas, diwalis, get-togethers. So people will come back, they will gather, they're traveling. So there's going to be a lot of purchase which I think which will happen. So in terms of trends, yes, Formals was a very subdued space till April this year, but we've seen a lot of formal wear happening there. Primarily, if you see, uh, there are a lot of ceremonial suits which does very well during this period. People have started going back to offices, therefore formal wear purchases have gone up. But if you ask as a trend, I would still say casualization as a trend will continue for some time going forward. Mm -hmm. And I think I heard that a lot of marriages are happening now. So like, have you seen a shift towards what people were purchasing as an individual to more of a like, for house or probably, you know, more of a uh, kind of, you know, kind of custom related shopping or is it like normal casual is happening more right now? No, so ceremonial, Indian ceremonial wear is something uh, which is doing extremely well. Uh, we've also forayed with our own brand called Ethnics by Raymond. Uh, yeah. And if you see every other brand today has launched a ceremonial Indian ethnic wear today in men's wear section. And that speaks volumes about how, so primarily it was an unorganized market. The conversion today which is happening is from unorganized to organized. And that is happening at a much faster, that's going at a much faster pace than the unorganized market. 
makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot. Of sense. Anybody has? Sorry, you have any point around this shopping trends and all? Yeah. So I I'd like to pick up a few points from where Manish left off. I think uh, post COVID and within in in the space when we were all troubled during COVID, a lot of people took time to sit back and figure out what they need to do, and many resets have happened across every organization. And the resets are for various reasons and in various functions. Uh, and these resets have allowed every brand to come back very strongly and address their core strengths. You know, so prior to that, we were all in a in a kind of a race where it was very very difficult to stand by and kind of ponder over what's happening. But these two years have allowed everybody to look through their entire business, uh, look at how things are developing around us. Uh, what are the areas which we never considered important and things where, which can come and hit us uh, so badly. Uh, these have all come across and we have kind of experienced all of them. So I think uh, one, uh, across every function that the business has, there is a reset happened for everybody, uh, which has allowed now the brands to really look forward to uh, positioning themselves well in the areas of their strength whether offline, online, whether uh, what kind of categories they address. Uh, and look at and also aim for a very aggressive few years down the line. So I feel, uh, and I speak on behalf uh, for Spiker over here, that uh, nothing better could have happened for Spiker uh, than what has happened in the last two, three years. So one, those two years uh, really allowed us to you know, introspect and post that the kind of uh, communication which was built within the teams, uh, you know, first, first were out of compulsion because we couldn't meet each other, and, and hence a lot of things were kind of pushed online. And that as a culture, or I, I say as a uh, process, stayed back. I think a lot of uh, interaction happens now within the organizations. Uh, they are very frequent and also they are very meaningful. Uh, and which leads to very uh, quick decision making. You know, a lot of times we used to be uh, procrastinating on certain things, but now uh, because of the nature of habit that we kind of created for ourselves, I think decisions are much more faster, more fleet footed, uh, which is serving the entire industry well because I think at some point of time, we need to move towards optimizing and uh, creating efficiencies in every area of our, our business. So I think great uh, work has been done by everybody. And I haven't really met too many people who have not grown very well in the last uh, few months, years or so. Uh, yes, there have been certain uh, set of people who have kind of fallen by uh, for, for reasons uh, they could not manage, you know. But that also means that that much more opportunity for people have held well uh, during these times. So I think next couple of years, at least, I, I feel that uh, India is in a position to take up as much as we can. And I think a follow-up question uh, to what you said, and this is one of my favorite questions, is that how digital is digital for brick and mortar business? And can a brick and mortar business can be as fast and agile as probably these new age e-commerce companies with typical IT legacy systems of ERP? So how do you think we should be ready for this? Because I think this is a time with technology. And I think if you see traditionally, the companies who are into brick and mortar, they're pretty, I, I feel that in, in UK, at least in the market, they're pretty one step behind a new age technology company. So how do you think, we, what, what is the situation here and how do you pro probably plan to kind of tackle that? So again, uh, I can see from my experience at Spiker, I feel that uh, a brick and mortar, obviously there is a lag, okay? And because it's, it's difficult to, to navigate a much more bigger ship than a smaller ship, you know? So from that perspective, that lag is always going to be there. There are a few people who have kind of managed to uh, overcome those lags, but it would need a lot more uh, efficiency. It would need a lot more agile supply chain, which I feel doesn't exist in India in that sense. Okay, The entire uh, chain has to be uh, responsive to that kind of uh, a mitigation of the lag. But uh, having said that, we have, uh, we, I still feel that a lot more is happening and much more quicker now. Uh, but the pure play D2C businesses will be more sharper. Uh, they would be 
a lot more responsive. Uh, but again, there is a downside to it because, uh, you know, if you are going to eventually look at, so today, digital or e-commerce pure play, I feel is very less of efficient, uh, uh, you know, convenience, more of value or discounting, right? Till these two things are there, it's going to be difficult to get monies back into your home. So if you have to manage every aspect of the business and also make money, so I think they, you'll have to kind of balance it out. Uh, it completely depends on what your visibility and what your uh, you know aim is from the business. So yeah, if you want to stay small and agile, that's that's a that's a decision you have to make. But if you want to grow, you'll have to forsake a little bit of agility uh, for the growth. Uh, and I think that's sad, but it's really difficult to overcome that. Anybody has a point around it? Uh, so, so for me, as in uh, how I look at it, as in uh, we were D two C even before the so-called D2Cs came into the fore. So if I look at our retail business, they were D2C businesses, as in we had far more consumer information than a lot of other players had who were selling on marketplaces and still didn't have consumer information. So I think that's, having said that, uh, I think uh, where businesses like ours have progressed now is that we have started leveraging technology to get on those responses faster. So while we had a brick and mortal format, we've expanded into the digital arena also. So what is happening is that we are able to get consumer responses. We are able to function like a D2C, as in the new age D2C businesses, but at the same time, uh, as in have the scale of the traditional uh, uh, brick and mortal uh, sort of stores. So I think the future very clearly lies in terms of how efficiently you are able to merge those two worlds, how efficiently, uh, efficiently you are able to leverage that feedback, which is much faster that you can get in through digital media. How are you able to transform your business? See, the reality is and uh, that a lot of our businesses, as in even though we are fashion businesses, we will or we are transforming into technology businesses. So that's the future. The faster that we are able to do it, the better it is. Yes, you'll have, like Sanjay said, you, we do have challenges in terms of supply chains and other things that would also change. But I think that's where the areas and guys like you would come in in terms of saying that, can I get something in 60 days? Can I get something in 90 days? Which traditionally has been a 180 day sort of a typical model that we have had. So we need to look at, and there again as an I uh, organizations, need to realize that as in there will be certain areas which would be your core strengths. You need to start building partnerships with new age service providers who can give you those strengths. And then end of the day as in how well you are able to manage those partnerships is gonna help you in terms of winning the consumer. That's perfect and, and you know, so last two months when we launched our European operations, uh, so we are, we are from Fashion Right, it's a technology platform and I think we, we saw two years back that there's a real kind of lack of, there's a lot of black box of information, which is in, and fashion is a very old industry, right? It's not new, but there's so many people involved and that's where we come in. And when we, sp so I spent about two months talking to all the big retailers in, in, in Europe and UK and what I found, which is very interesting actually, that a simple thing, right? Which probably I'm sure the brands in India have solved, right? Do you know, when you get your, you know, your materials, right? They, they don't have any visibility because there's a, there's a big, you know, there's a big difference between how you talk to supplier, right? You can't because there's a, you know, there's a lot of people in between which operates. So I think from a technology standpoint, I think disrupt, there's a real requirement of disruption in this industry. And I think, as you said, you've done, you've started doing D2C way before when D2C was a term actually. And I think I, I remember, I mean, I, I used to, I'm, I'm a big fan of your, brand actually and it's pretty good. I mean, it's retail, your retail presence is really good. But I think technology is one thing which, which, which makes a retailer, you know, stand apart from because you guys have the power to kind of, you know, you've done the real business actually, right? So you, when you, when you bring a technology in it, I think nobody can actually beat the, beat, you know, from a, from a visibility point of view. So, so, so from, from SSIPL perspective, you have any views around that? Uh, yes. So, we have been into retail for past 20 years, but COVID taught us that how to engage with our customers digitally. And it is imperative for any business to have a digital engagement because 
the covid has changed the customer behavior drastically the screen time has increased to 4.5 hours as per a formal report published by times of india what does that mean that means people are spending more times on screen the impact is also shown on other industries people are not moving to uh, theaters to watch movies people are getting you know products at their doorsteps so all these things all these elements all these aspects are indicating that you know the customer has changed their behavior completely and forever i would not only be attributing this behavior change to covid but another factor which we overlook is uh, the generation z generation z is uh, is the is the youngest cohort that we have in our customer base so these are the customers who are more aware who are more tech savvy and who are more informed so uh, to interact with any brand they prefer the digital medium so it is again very important for any brand to present in the digital space to have their present in the digital space uh, not to only attain a top line or or to or to sales number or to or to you know uh, maintain the bottom line but also it helps in the brand building because digital environment enables any business to convey their brand philosophy to their customer directly having said that uh, we were talking about technology and uh, i hope everyone here would resonate with me that the the d2c is the new age aspect that is coming into the picture people are like fed up of amazons and flipkarts of the world as a marketplace it is only be seen as a channel to liquidate inventory no brand building happening there you don't know whom you are interacting with as a customer so to have the customer data to have to know to know the customer dynamics and the behavior any business should have a digital presence uh, in house website so that you know you can you can interact with your customer directly and have the insights directly so d2c is another concept which is going to stay there very long now every brand is uh, aware of like d2c and what is the importance and how the marketplace is shattering away their you know uh, customer base and user experience so d2c is there the third point i would like to bring on the table is omni channel so omni channel means every brand since beginning the conventional retail has multiple channels uh, multiple channels of doing businesses multiple channels of doing marketing multiple channels of uh, doing the last mile deliveries but no no system is talking to each other in real time it is very imperative in these days to you know have a well synced uh, information system in place or it in place which enables all these channels to have the right kind of cohesiveness so that if your customer is interacting with one channel moving to the other but he still seeing the same impact there he is still able to experience your brand in the same way he was experience in the previous channel so omni channel d2c uh, are the new age business concepts which uh, any business should focus on and should practice upon uh, thirdly i would say uh, as i mentioned generation z uh, since they are well informed uh, they go through a lot of content reviews feedbacks about the product or services they purchase or they spend on so uh, sustainability also comes into the picture because this generation is very sensitive about what they are purchasing what they are doing as an activity in the shopping environment so gone are the days when you we used to acquire customer with the cashbacks there was a flood of cashbacks earlier when the e-commerce came into the picture in 2010 but now the game has changed forever people have started asking about the yarn that you know that is used to build to manufacture an apparel earlier we used to sell apparel by the name of brand or other attributes like size fits colors but now people started this generation xz has started asking for uh, is the dye used uh, to color this apparel is skin friendly or environment friendly whether this cotton that we have procured from has has uh, you know met all the environmental measures so this kind of awareness this kind of uh, proactiveness is prevailing in the society and it is going to remain there for a very long time so to maintain the business line to maintain the reputation to build a brand one needs to have all three practices in place and 
and can enjoy and leverage the success. And what about cost? Like, I mean, have you seen a shift of cost? Like, you can probably ask for a higher price you used to do when you bring in sustainability into the equation, or how is it like? So, if there is a logic behind sustainability, if brand is conveying that, you know, mm -hmm. I am going with a paperless operation, okay. or for example, I am uh, procuring this uh, superior or premium quality of cotton without impacting, without impacting or without doing any damage to the environment, then this customer, this cohort of the society is ready to pay the premium. Okay, they are responsible enough, they know what they are doing. It's a very interesting top, I mean, yes. point actually. So, yeah. Sumit, I have a different point of view on that. So, I think very clearly as in, in terms of when I look at the consumer today, mm -hmm. uh, sustainability uh, uh, in terms of your environmental responsiveness, uh, uh, how you are as in, in terms of your whole supply chain, in terms of how you are managing that, in terms of your procurements and other things are becoming very, very important. But very clearly as in, when I look at it, and since we've been running sustainability for a long period of time, and we have a very big program called Pepe Future under which an umbrella that we run it, very clearly the consumer doesn't and is not ready to pay a premium for it. Yeah. Uh, the premium that you get it get is in terms of uh, the co uh, cohesiveness or the uh, attachment that you build with the brand uh, that the consumer feels that I relate to this brand better because I believe in this sustainability and this brand also believes in sustainability. If I say that this pair of denim as in is washed with one cup of denim, uh, cup of water as compared to some 160 odd liters that a normal process would take and that's why you have to pay 1000 rupees extra, he's not ready to do that. Uh, I, that's what our experience is. Uh, it is becoming big but at the same time it is more in terms of how, you're, how the consumer uh, is able to relate to you, how you are able to build those consum uh, communities within those consumers. Uh, I think that's where the advantage lies. Uh, I don't think that you're, you will be able to charge premium for just being sustainable. Yeah, I, I had the same uh, understanding because I think when I go to a shop right now, I see the prices which is lower than two years before somehow. I mean, brands are offering more discounts. I don't know why. So I mean, you, I was you are not from Generation Z. I mentioned Generation Z who are the potential customer going to become for a longer run, you need to target them. Currently, the scenario is as such that, you know, as Sir mentioned, that, you know, the price war and the discounts war and product, some experiment with the product is, is leading the game. But if you see a long-term sustainability, lo you want to sustain longer in the market, you need to have all these concepts built in. No, no I agree. Like for example, I, I think about two months back, I was at uh, Primark, right? It's one of the largest retailers. There were a whole section of, uh, you know, recycled uh, clothes, recycled shoes, recycled jeans, all, uh, everything you think, you, it, they've recycled it. But still the pricing which I've seen there, right, it's pretty competitive. So do you think it is more to do with the kind of supplying, you know, kind of manufacturer they have? How do they manage to get, you know, recycled product at a pretty competitive price compared to, say, uh, Next, the who sells it like 10, 10 times of uh, what Primer sells. So how, what's your view around that? See, the other reality is that if you look at it, uh, sustainability actually doesn't cost much. So if you take it up as a challenge and uh, you start, uh, the reality is that whenever you start building something from scratch, you don't have economies of scale and that's where as in you, it might look like that this is going to be a big investment or this is something which is having a dent on my margins. The reality is that once you take it up uh, and institutionalize it as a goal, uh, sustainability as in it doesn't mean that you have to pay extra as in you would be able to either get the cost to similar what you are in certain cases you will also be able to get cost advantages and the bigger difference is that as in in terms of once you are able to build that relationship with the consumer the overall lifetime value of the consumer that you have and that's where the biggest gain comes in and I firmly believe whether it is Gen Z or uh, any of the other generations that are there uh, this is something which is uh, more of a universal phenomena. Everybody wants uh, today that as in the world that we are living in and we especially having seen what has happened with COVID, uh, we want to live uh, or we want to leave a better future for our kids, for the future generations. So I think that's, that's a fundamental uh, 
theme that runs across generations, that runs across age groups today. So uh, those are things uh, that have become a reality. I agree with that. In fact, I so think just just to add on this, I feel uh, it's never going to be utopian as far as sustainability is concerned. You know, there is there's a whole lot of things that one can one needs to be done, but there's a lot of it which is not practical. You know, depending on which brand, which cohort that you are addressing. What he mentioned is still possible if you're talking to a much more smaller cohort, who is so con he was so aligned to the whole idea of sustainability and ready to, be the, to pay the price for it. What he said is more practical because largely speaking, we are master's brands. We're talking to a much more wider audiences. But what I believe and I take out of this whole effort is that where we stand today, if we can get any better than that, I think it's a step in the right direction. So if I'm not able to really engage and implement anything and everything that it comes under the umbrella of sustainability in my organization or in my products or in my processes, can I at least do something which is moving a step ahead and in that same direction where we try and achieve the, the optimum? Uh, and in this space, I think the industry has really done quite a few remarkable things. And I speak on behalf of the denim industry. Uh, and I am sure money should agree on the same that right from the yarn stage moving up to processes automation a lot of work has been done so that the carbon footprint can be reduced there is a lot more sustainable and more eco-friendly processes that you can employ whether it's in the chemical stage or so many of our, our, our aspects he mentioned versus 170 liters of water today washes consume only one glass of water. So I think these are very radical changes and changes we are sustainable to maintain sustainability. So for the sake of just being gimmicky, a lot of people will want to say some things, but to be fair and honest to ourselves and also to the future generations, I think organizations need to incorporate uh, any and every measure, however small, uh, in a manner which is permanent, you know, so that at least we are there, we have bettered something from yesterday and not allowing it to get worsened by the day. And I, I think I totally agree with that because I remember on our platform when we added, so we had a pretty large catalog, right, on which brand can come and choose what category they want to purchase. And we added a denim category. We started putting pointers like, you know, it's recyclable, it's sustainable, it is made up of this. And as soon as customers, our brand saw that, they got very excited. And I think mostly D2C brand have started coming and saying, okay, can we, can we get these denims? who are made up of probably 100% plastic. No, you know, and it's pretty sustainable. So we see, I think I agree with that. I think people like to have that sustainable point buzzword in their, in their, uh, you know, in their catalog. That, that brings me to the, so you have a point, uh, you know, yeah? I, I wanted to speak on that uh, digital and uh, brick and mortar thing. So I really believe is that digital is something which every brand is adapted to a good level right now. There's nothing it, one brand is going digital only and one brand is going bigger. Now the brands are adapting both the models. So if you think that way, malls, malls is kind of something which is digital right now. Previously there were no malls uh, if we go, go back some years. So malls, when the shop was opened, it was the same thing that it was malls in malls or high street location. Pe khole. But eventually, malls ko adapt karna pada sari brands ko. So similarly, digital bhi isi tarah se adaption mein aaya. And ab brands dono segments ko, brick and mortar ko, digital ko equally treat karta hai. It is not like mera revenue contribution kidar se zada hai. Brands ke liye focus dono jaga pe hi zada hai. And that brings me to my another question that, see, D2C brands have touched revenues which I see a typical retailer has probably took a lot of years to reach. For example, I see a lot of D2C brand, and it, this is across the globe, which has reached like 500 crores, 1,000 crores of revenues, while the retailers have probably taken 10 years. So what is what are your views of that? Because it's pretty interesting to kind of see this, right? But I'll say, what time is Abhi time hi aisa hai. This time, if even if a brand launches itself in a brick and mortar concept, still it will have a high uh, velocity compared to any brand who has launched 10 years back. The 10 years ago, the CEO of MD thought that today's 
founder entrepreneur sochta hai there is a vast difference so today a uh, uh, entrepreneur has funds to acquire the customer a uh, entrepreneur has funds to do the r and d on research and everything and entrepreneurs are aggressive they want to take the risk they want to experiment all this of all these things eventually have resulted in uh, good revenues for some brands so it is not matlab main ye cheez nahi accept kar sakta ke डिजिटल ब्रांड्स ने बहुत अच्छा रेवेन्यू किए कर लिया दिस ये टाइम ही ऐसा था लास्ट वन एंड हाफ ईयर्स और टू इयर्स वे द कंज्यूमर वाज एग्रेसिव ब्रांड्स वेर एग्रेसिव एंड फंडिंग्स वेर वेरी मच एग्रेसिव सो द होल मार्केट वाज गोइंग इन अ ग्रेट वेलोसिटी तो इस टाइम में अगर कोई ब्रांड लॉन्च कर रहा है द प्रोडक्ट इज न्यू द प्रोडक्ट इज गुड लाइक सिद्धार्थ सैड उनका एक्स वाई एक्स एक्स ब्रांड कोविड के बाद पिक किया सो कोविड के बाद वो टाइम ही ऐसा था तो इवेंचुअली ये टाइम में हर ब्रांड को पिक होना ही था इवन इफ यू वांट टू स्टार्ट अ ब्रिक एंड बॉटर ब्रांड टुडे यू यू स्टिल हैव दैट सेम पावर लाइक अ डिजिटल ब्रांड आई एग्री यू हैव द सेम बिकॉज़ आई इट्स क्विकर फॉर इट्स टू लॉन्ग फॉर रिटेलर्स वेल people were forced to go uh, to ecom channels so as a result what he saying i agree that the last two years forced you to sort of uh, go digital as a result people who were d2c they saw a fast growth but going forward i think uh, i don't think it's a d2c versus a brick and mortar because a lot of speakers are saying that there is going to be a merger which will happen brands which will succeed will have to play the game in both the places it's not as if either this or that you have to have your omni channel play you have to make sure that on your uh, this thing you are very good at your digital play at the same time at some point of time you will have to make sure that he can either buy digital pick it up from a store or buy from a store return it digitally that's where the thing will come to where where i think both the channels will merge it cannot be this or that is what i feel but how are you solving this like for example raymond in my mind when i think about raymond i i i think myself in a store looking at the you know suits and then buying from it so how are you changing that perception because you know that, and that's a big perception shift actually because for me a one other brand i don't care right i can just buy it online but how do you how do you tackle this well it's a big challenge um, are the more expensive products that you start selling people trust to go to physical stores want to have a touch and hand feel of the product how it looks on you they want to give you a trial it's very difficult to create that digitally digitally where we have succeeded is we have partner with uh, uh, portals created product specifically for them and which is not something which is unique to us i think every fashion brand today during the last two years has created smus which have done well on the channels having said that again if you look at our suits that's probably compared to our polos our suits probably don't do that well in the ecom channel it doesn't sell beyond a certain price point you can sell your basic black blue blazers moment you get into fashion colors it's very difficult to make sure that you sell it through a digital channel similarly if you look at ethnics which is a completely ceremonial wear nobody buys it from uh, so somebody is getting married is not going to buy a sherwani online that's very difficult to imagine somebody doing that the process is very physical so that's where i think we we have seen a, a challenge uh, we have tried something called online tailoring where we have tried to um, make the person uh, choose a certain style a certain fabric digitally in standard sizes that has sort of worked for us right where we are saying that we try and give you something which is catered to your style like you have five styles you choose choose what which are the trims you want to pick and choose what kind of buttons what kind of collars what kind of cuffs that has worked for us where we have sort of allowed him to do some customization digitally beyond that doesn't work for us make makes a lot of sense and i think we have 5 minutes so i'll probably ask my last question because it's one of the most uh, probably important question design right uh, we see on our platform we have to add a lot of designs day to day basis because i think it's a at least europe uk is a design led market people just look at design and they buy it so we have to do trend forecasting and all those how important design is for the indian market like i mean do you also i mean from a brand perspective do you spend a lot of time on designer to create a probably a very nice catalog with nice designs or is it not that important i mean what's your views on that so see effectively as in you look at uh, 
any business per se, as in you have to first understand your consumer and then there are basically four variables that you play on. One is product, second is price, third is uh, the brand and fourth is the consumer experience that you bundle along with it. And different brands take different routes in terms of combinations. So I'll, I'll have a combination of brand and a price. I'll have a brand combination. So if you look at Apple as in it's probably the product and the brand that comes along. But effectively as in if you look at it, any combination that you go with, product plays the most important role at least in our industry. And I think it holds across all industries. If you don't have a great product as in no matter what price you do, what branding you do on it, it doesn't work. So design for us, uh, and I can probably speak uh, for the fashion industry per se, is the heart of the business. Uh, it is the most important thing that uh, helps us in terms of meeting those consumer expectations. And it is the heart and soul of our business. Got it. Anybody else? Any point? Or? Yeah. So uh, I'll split, split design into core and say fashion. Right? Uh, you. So for acquiring new customers, right, typically, uh, largely your core will work fine because that's your basic price point and consumers will kind of come to you, right? But how do you retain your existing customers, right? Can you offer them a little more variety? Can you offer them more design, right? So that is one view through which design plays a very important role, right? You need to keep on adding more and more styles to your existing assortment. The second thing is staying relevant, right? Now, wh what I mean by that is, Designs which say would have worked about say a year back might not be the designs that kind of work going forward, right? So uh, and India typically adopts designs say one or two years after the West kind of adopts it, and this still exists in the country. COVID might have shortened that period, right? But uh, largely that still exists. So uh, looking at what kind of trends are existing in the West, and uh, and there are certain fashion-forward brands in India that are coming forward and doing it right now. So I think design for every, I think whether it's a casual brand or a formal brand or any brand or an innerwear brand, right, which is something you don't even see, designing is extremely important and I think it's a very important tool via which you stay relevant to the Got consumer. It. So which means if you're a fashion designer, you know which brand to reach out, right? You may have a lot of opening for fashion designer. <laughs> Great. Thank you, guys. I think uh, it was a, I really liked the answers. It was a pretty, pretty, uh, I think, uh, at least an enlightening session for me. Thank you so much, uh, audiences.